Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good morning. This is Jim Hannink with the open door, open to God's love, open to the wisdom of the Spirit, and open to our listeners. We're doing something unusual today. Ordinarily, when we're on, we're on at a different time of the day, but today we're on at 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, so some of our participants are much more awake than they usually are. And we are here at a conference, a a very good conference, a timely conference, at Biola University in La Mirada, California, the greater Los Angeles area. And uh, the conference is called Caring, Not Killing. And it's addressing a range of -of end-of-life issues with a special regard, of course, to euthanasia and what we might call stealth euthanasia. Uh, Here in California, we've just uh, made the incredible blunder of making legal, making legal so-called physician-assisted suicide. At any rate, because we're at a conference, You'll be hearing, gentle listeners, and any radio texts that will help us uh, clean up this discussion uh, in terms of vibrations and echoes and the like, you'll be hearing people milling about. We've chosen a place here at the conference where there's less milling about rather than more milling about. Now, what we're going to do is today begin with... Uh, something from the uh, Right to Life plank of the Solidarity Party, uh, which we touched upon briefly yesterday. This is a Friday show. Ordinarily we're on uh, uh, Friday, but today it's a Saturday. And yesterday, towards the end of the Right to Life plank of the platform, we come to our, our opposition to euthanasia. And I would like to have uh, uh, a member of the National Committee, uh, Professor Skylar Kovich from Channel Islands, uh, California State University at Channel Islands, uh, speak a bit about the platform's pro-life commitment, especially with regard to euthanasia, and more especially still, with regard to the special risk that, that people with disabilities face. Uh, Skyler's kindly consented to be with us for the first, let's say, 15 or 20 minutes of our discussion, and then he will be followed by uh, Brian Johnston, who is a stalwart of the Right to Life Committee here in California. Skyler. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanning. Uh, very glad to be here at this conference. And uh, so the American Solidarity Party is uh, dedicated to uh, the quest to end the, the very tragic practice of assisted suicide and uh, euthanasia. And uh, we've heard some presentations from people here this morning from both the uh, you know, what they would call the Christian movement against assisted suicide, uh, as well as the disability rights movement against assisted suicide. Uh, And what they both have in common is a dedication to uh, recognizing that people have rights to uh, live lives and uh, with dignity and to continue to have their lives protected. Uh, you know, from the Christian view, you would think of it as, you know, because that we all are, uh, you know, children of God and we have the, uh, the, the right to, you know, continued medical care, 
uh, yeah, for the rest of our lives. Uh, so uh, we've heard from uh, kind of a, a, a theologian who discussed from that perspective, uh, you know, someone who uh, discussed it from the perspective of uh, disability rights and also from the uh, medical perspective. And a couple of these speakers have mentioned, you know, running for office is a really important part of that. So we are hoping to have, the, the Solidarity Party has already had the presidential campaign, a campaign for uh, New Jersey State Legislature, and we'll hopefully have uh, some candidates running for office in 2018, uh, including in this uh, L.A. area in California, who will run on those principles. Thanks very much for that uh, framework that you've given us. I, I want to call attention, Skylar, and get your response to uh, something that Pope Francis said two days ago, two days ago, in an address uh, that was held uh, at a conference sponsored by the Pontifical Academy for Life. He said, quote, a systematic tendency, there is a systematic tendency toward growing inequality in health care, both globally, especially between different continents, and within individual, especially wealthy countries, where options for health care often depend more on economic resources than the actual need for treatment. Now, one of the things that the American Solidarity Party is strongly lobbying for is a basic access to health care. And when that access to health care isn't available, uh, there's a, a, a almost a pervasive tendency to cut off from decent health care people who need it the most, including people with long-term disabilities. And, of course, that's a setup for the promotion of physician-assisted suicide. But it's noteworthy, I think, that the Holy Father conjoins the issues of inequality in health care with the disability aspect and with, of course, the overarching culture of death resort to euthanasia. Skylar, maybe you could address this. Right. It's, I, healthcare is an extremely complex issue. I won't pretend to be an expert on it and all of the different policy reforms that need to be done in order to promote as much equality in access to health care as possible. But there are some fundamental uh, starting points to the conversation that we have to prioritize uh, protecting the weakest from exploitation uh, by people who do not have the right priorities, who, who don't prioritize uh, you know, protecting life. And so we've heard about this uh, from one of the speakers, for example, today at the conference who discussed uh, uh, you know, big problems with the for-profit hospice industry, both in, in the ways that they uh, you know, culturally, just fundamentally don't uh, believe in the culture of life who uh, kind of give substandard care uh, toward the end of life. It doesn't mean that you continue to uh, uh, use methods that uh, prolong life when, you know, you don't continue to use methods that prolong life uh, when it's, you know, clear that death is going to happen naturally. But at the same time, there are certain fundamental uh, aspects of care that, that need to be maintained. And uh, we need to all keep that as an important part of the conversation. Yes. Now, let me ask you to comment on two more short passages from the Holy Father's address. He says, and now I'm citing him, the anguish associated with conditions that bring us to the threshold of human mortality 
and the difficulty of the decision we have to make may tempt us to step back from the patient. Yet this is where, more than anything else, we are called to show love and closeness, recognizing the limit that we all share and showing our solidarity. Uh, that's absolutely true. And uh, so, again, it, I am in the political, sci uh, political science. I have no uh, medical expertise or, uh, you know, even uh, you know, basic experience in that area. But we have to show solidarity with the medical workers who do have the right priorities and with the patients. You know, we all have patients in our families who, who need this sort of care. Uh, and will at some point as individuals in the future. Uh, so, you know, me personally, I am disabled, I'm totally blind, which is not a disability that uh, has a lot of physical pain in itself. But we all need to do our part and, and you know, continue to build solidarity uh, with those who are weakest and, and who are being exploited. Thank you again. Now, I know you want to get on to the conference itself. I'm going to ask you to comment on one last passage from Pope Francis's address. And uh, in the passage you just commented on, the Holy Father uses the word solidarity. There is a term that he's going to use in this passage that I'm certain will uh, lead you to comment on the character of the American Solidarity Party. The Holy Father says, the state cannot renounce its duty to protect all those involved defending the fundamental equality whereby everyone is recognized under law as a human being living with others in society. Particular attention must be paid to the most vulnerable who need help in defending their own interests. Now bear with me, two more sentences. If this core of values, our party looks to core values, if this core of values essential to coexistence is weakened, the possibility of agreeing on that recognition of the other, the other, which is the condition of all dialogue and the very life of society will be lost. One more sentence. Legislation on health care also needs this broad vision and comprehensive view of what most effectively promotes the common good. Right. Yes, it, and it, unfortunately, neither of the parties, the, neither the Democratic health care proposals nor the Republican ones, uh, seem to be able to match that. And again, it's going to be uh, very difficult to get to that point, but we always need to keep that as part of the conversation uh, with the right balance of you know, making sure that the programs that provide that are being funded. But at the same time, if programs are con going to continue, if, if the government doesn't prioritize meeting a culture of life, uh, we're going to have a big problem no matter which, you know, even if we can get to the point of providing more funding for health care. You know, both the financial side of it and the cultural side of it need to be built up. Uh, I'm going to let Skyler go now, but I, uh, I just want to mention that when he says neither the Democrats nor the Republicans seem to have the vision that's necessary, he is saying something that many bishops, American bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, have been saying for decades, again and again and again. We read opinion pieces that say, in effect, Catholics have no real home in the contemporary political domain. And, well, you could work to try to change one of the major parties, but our decision has been to open up a new party and we hope that uh, the, the people will give us a serious hearing. Now, Skyler, you are hereby uh, dispensed, and you can return from this, this, uh, this uh, uh, Internet show 
to the conference, and I am going to ask a different speaker to join us at this point. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hannig. Thank you for all your hard work. Oh, it's actually a pleasure. Now, the, the hard work at this point is, is freeing, freeing our next guest who is engaged in uh, what Peter Morin of the Catholic Worker oftentimes called the clarification of thought. It's an ongoing process. He's, uh, he's uh, exemplifying the fact that uh, none of us here in the pro-life movement uh, think in lockstep, and uh, it's somebody who's somebody who's been dialoguing over the decades, but with a firm vision. I introduce What's to you, I introduce to you Brian Johnson, uh, Right to Life, uh, and the representative, the Western representative of the National Right to Life. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about this conference. Well, Dr. Jim, thank you for joining us conference, it's critically important that people understand the right to life isn't just about the cuteness of babies. You know, in advertising, advertisers say the number one image, after Pretty Girl, the number one image to get people's empathy and feelings is to show the picture of a baby. It's, it's very useful. I know E-Trade has a great ad, that talking baby, but throughout advertising, they use pictures of babies to, to get emotional but to get people emotionally committed to something, and that's good news for us. I suggest if you're concerned about the abortion issue, show pictures of that living child in the womb because advertising and sociology tell us that people respond to that. But here's the bad news. If that's the depth of your commitment to the right to life, the fact that, oh, we're killing cute babies. If it's only an emotional commitment, and not an understanding that the reason killing babies is wrong isn't because they're cute. It's because they're a unique human being that is vulnerable. If you don't understand that basic principle, at the other end of life, when you're not cute, at the other end of life, when you start costing people money, at the other end of life, when it gets very hard to start changing your diaper again, they start calling them chucks. When you have to change adult chucks on the, on the bed of someone who is disabled and medically dependent or gone along in years in a longer continent, when you're changing those diapers, it's not quite as emotionally sweet as those babies are. And if your commitment is only an emotional commitment, then you are very ripe for where our culture is going. Because our culture is using killing, intentional killing, as a social tool. And that, as you have talked about, Dr. Henning, our state of California has now legalized that. And this is significant on many levels, not just for the sake of the patients. That is a great loss, every individual life that's ended. Again, this is not about letting nature take its course. This is about using medicine against the patient legally to end their life. And that is a direct violation of the Hippocratic Oath, which is 3,000 years old. This is the basis of medicine. In the Hippocratic Oath, the doctor swore, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty learned, I know a lot of stuff, I know about herbs and medicines, and I will never, ever use this to harm a vulnerable individual in my care. I will never do this, even if asked. Now, that's the Hippocratic Oath, 3,000 years old. Many contemporary people say, oh, well, you know, you know, medicine's changed, and so we have to have a new, we have to talk about when people ask to die, I'm sorry, this issue's been around for 3,000 years. The temptation to use the knowledge of medicine and the power over the human body that medicine brings, that temptation has always been there. And we've seen it abused throughout the centuries, and we've condemned that abuse. We condemn it particularly when it's institutionalized. But I have to tell you, that temptation is very rampant. I'll give you a very specific example. People are terrified and alarmed by mass killings. We saw what happened in Las Vegas. What a terrible killing. He killed 50 odd, almost 60 people, 500 injured in the charges afterwards, and people trying to get away from that killer. We saw the shootings in Texas. I'm sorry. You realize the most common mass killings, and they're very widely documented, they're just not talked about. They're medical mass killings. And those medical mass killers, those angels of death, it's not just Kevorkian, 
This is when it's illegal to use medicine to kill, but the greatest mass killers in all of human history have been physicians. In recent history, it was in Hyde, England, which is a, 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 a subset of Manchester, and their Dr. Hillman had killed 700 mostly elderly people that he befriended. In England, he was a government-sponsored doctor because uh, they have socialized health care there. But more to the point, uh, he would make house calls on the elderly. Most of the people that he killed were elderly women. And the reason he got caught, because, again, what does a doctor do? Everything a doctor does is in confidence, is basically directly in that personal relationship with that patient. So that particular murderer, the reason he got caught is he actually arranged to be the heir on many of their wills. But that's just one example. There are many. Just recently in Germany, there was a nurse. They thought he had killed 26. This last week, uh, we're talking right now on November 18th. On November 16th, go back and Google. Google uh, Angel of Death, Germany. And they don't tell. It turns out that this gentleman actually, they believe, has killed hundreds. The problem is when medical killing is practiced, it's done quietly. It's done in confidence. And they don't tell people. And they think that this is just, oh, what's this medicine? People die. Oh, well. But they get away with murder. And you can go back. Go ahead and Google. If you have any chance, Google Angel of Death Medicine. And you will see throughout human history Doctors have been the widest spread mass killers. It's happening, and that's when it's illegal. Now, when it's legalized, and there have been societies, even Western societies, most recently in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, but it was the medical doctors, and they started, they didn't start killing Jews. They started in what's known as the T4 program for Tiergarten Schia, address in Berlin. Tiergarten is a region, a neighborhood in Berlin, and Schia is the address number four. So Tiergarten 4 was the address for the headquarters for eliminating the handicapped, the medic, medically dependent, the mentally dependent. Uh, that were costing. They had socialized medicine there in Germany after 1933. They needed to save on costs. And so there were certain groups of human beings that they knew were costing money. And they figured in the name of compassion, that was the best thing to do, because these people, who would want to live like that? And they gradually expanded this. These were doctors. These were medical doctors, out of compassion, eliminating their patients by using medicine lethally. Well, we know what happened there, because it went from keeping, it was designed to keep the German Aryan people, to keep the gene pool clean. So actually, the final solution was originally designed to make sure that there would be no defectives reproducing, no defective areas, but it expanded and expanded. And they actually, many of those killed were World War I vets that were mustard gas victims that were in institutions in Germany. You can go back and, and research this. It's called the Tiergarten 4 program or Tiergarten 4. And that's what became the final solution. They decided to expand the practice. So that even though you read, uh, Eric Fromm has a great book, The Art of Loving. You read The Art of Loving, he was an a Austrian psychologist, that psychiatrist, who was in Auschwitz. And he talked about the attitude of the people in Auschwitz. And what he wanted to do was warn those. He saw people go off to their death knowingly. And you know why? They were being worked to death. They would get sick. And you had an option if you got sick. You know who you saw? You went to the infirmary. You, you saw, saw the doctor. doctor. Doctors, doctors were the killers. Doctors, doctors were using medicine, medicine to kill. kill. And, and at the end, end of World War II, there was, there was a very famous trial, trial called the Nuremberg Trials. But the Nuremberg Trials were not for trying the Germans for invading France or Poland or the Low Countries, for starting World War II, for the Anschluss, for the Sudetenland. No. The Nuremberg trials were specifically to try the existing government for one basic principle, for killing their own people. They were put on trial not for killing French, not for killing, killing the, the uh, Poles. They were put on trial for killing their own innocent civilians. And it was a specific medical trial 
1947, and it specifically addressed the T4 program as the genesis of the medical widespread killing. So if you want to look, if you're concerned about what happened in Las Vegas, and gosh, you don't like mass killing, i got to tell you, every one of those lives was valuable that died on that Las Vegas parking lot, every single life that was shot. But that doesn't hold a candle. Because if you look at the mass shootings that have happened, some of those are up in the double digits. Look at the angels of death just in the last 30 years, not only in the U.S., but in other Western countries. And this is when it's illegal to do so. Most of them are in the triple digit, killing the vulnerable in their care. So there's a reason that the Hippocratic Oath was there, because it is the physician that is most tempted to use their knowledge against the vulnerable in their care. And if there is not a bright delineating line to prevent that, if there is not that prohibition, they will become killers. And that's the reason the Hippocratic Oath is put into place. Why is it no other profession? No other profession says, I'll never kill people. You know why? Because this is the profession that has the most opportunity, the best knowledge to do it quietly, efficiently, and silently. They have people who are very near death. Their job is to help them either to comfort them. If they can't cure, they swear they will comfort, but never kill. It's now been violated in your nation. You have now joined part of Western civilization that has broken with that tradition that goes back 3,000 years. The cultural cost to our culture will be great. That's what the right to life is about. Brian, I, I, I just want to thank you for, first of all, uh, giving us a historically informed vision of the struggle to build a culture of life. Uh, it's just so important. But I have a couple more questions here sure. that I want to pose. One, having given us a powerful historical overview, along with uh, our adequate, more than adequate, uh, description of just what we're facing today, uh, there's this term that comes to mind. The term is, Cognitive dissonance. Yes. One of the characteristics of any given culture, I hate to speak as an anthropologist, but one of the given characteristics of a culture is that it's very pervasive. And, well, there are many people who have, at least at some point, caught sight of the culture of death. But it is so powerful and so pervasive that when we hear again uh, uh Truly, what should I say, no holds barred historical perspective on what's happened. It's hard to keep a firm fitting, uh, a firm footing, sorry, it's, 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 it's fitting that we keep a firm footing, not to be silly, but it's extremely difficult. And yes. there are various ways of dealing with this cognitive dissonance. So one is to stick your head back in the ground, and that's probably the most favored way. Another way is to uh, adopt some sort of, uh, what should I call it, sincere but uninformed response that doesn't connect with the conditions that a pro-life movement needs to connect with. And it just so happens that at practically any pro-life conference, there are people who represent that view. And I happen to have uh, overheard you discussing just a short time ago with uh, another such group called the Abolition Movement. And I wonder if you could just briefly describe that kind of response and how is somebody who's been with the pro-life movement for the long haul at every level uh, would, would see as the best way of addressing not the people who have their heads stick in the ground, but uh, the people who uh, are maybe spinning out of control? Well, that's very – oh, let me just quickly then – uh, first of all, these folks are very, very sincere and admirable in their zeal. And yet we know I was actually quite, I enjoy the scriptures very much, and they, they enjoy quoting the scriptures, but it's very clear that zeal without knowledge is not good. That's a 
that are an important principle in the scripture. And we need to have knowledge about what we want to do. We're, we're about changing the laws. At one time, before Roe versus Wade, every state had laws that protected the unborn child. So it's important to recognize how our laws made. When Roe is overturned, we have to overturn Roe first. We have a Supreme Court justice now replacing Justice Scalia. That's increased our odds greatly. But we're still in that, in that mode. The real question is, when we get Roe overturned, what are we going to do? Are we just going to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? Very hard to do because Joe Sixpack and Sally Soap Opera, they may not view God the way you do, and they may be uncomfortable. They may call you the American Taliban, that we're just going to make laws according to your personal religion or theology. But that isn't what our founders said. Our founders were very wise, and all of them came from slightly different theological backgrounds. But they asserted something very interesting, what's known as natural law, the laws of nature, and specifically, and of nature's God. That they predicated the way we make our laws is based on self-evident truths, not on revealed truths. See, I have certain spiritual truths I've come to understand that have been revealed to me, and I accept them as revelation. For example, uh, the triune nature of God. I cannot, however, and it might be unwise for me to create a law that declares that all Californians, and there actually with people that, that have proposed that in California, an initiative to make Christianity the state, the state religion of California. Well, I'm not sure that's what the founders had in mind. But God has given all of us, and it, it, back to the scriptures, in Romans 1.20, it says that God has revealed his invisible nature to his visible creation. So they're without excuse. And what that means is that the principles of natural law, the laws of nature, are revealed. And we can point that out. When it comes to the issue of abortion, I think it's very important that we underscore the humanity of that child. That's why we have in common, and these are human laws that are designed to protect human beings. If that's not a human being with a beating heart, with distinct human attributes in every way, shape, and form that you and I have, except their size and their location. If that's a human being, that human being should be protected under the law. And so that's not a theological question. That's actually scientifically evident. That's a human being. And we have to pursue the passage of our laws in the same way. We have to demonstrate. We have to, if we are Christians, and again, we had a Christian discussion, a Christian must study to show themselves approved says in Timothy, a workman that need not be ashamed. So we have to show why. If nature is made by the God I believe in, then I should be able to show within nature why these laws should apply. And that's why those laws were there before Roe versus Wade. We want to replace those laws. So we have to do it wisely and pursue the way that the laws are made and not simply superimpose our theology on other people. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you to follow up on that by way of reading a paragraph. That's not so terribly long. It's a short paragraph, and the source is a source that I take with great seriousness. The source is Pope Francis, and this paragraph is the next-to-last paragraph an address in an address that he gave at a conference three days ago, sponsored by the Pontifical Academy for Life. Now, uh, as a longtime teacher, I always apologized to students for reading at them. But I always kept doing it because, for the most part, they didn't read. <laughs> so I'm going to read, with apologies, one short paragraph and then ask Brian to comment on that with regard particularly to uh, his, his emphasis on the nature of political action in a democratic society. So, enough of me. Here's the Holy Father. Within democratic societies, these sensitive issues must be addressed calmly, seriously, and thoughtfully, in a way open to finding, to the extent possible, agreed solutions, also on the legal level. 
On the one hand, there is a need to take into account differing worldviews, ethical convictions, and religious affiliations, and a climate of openness and dialogue. Now we're halfway through the paragraph. Here comes the balance. On the other hand, the state cannot renounce its duty to protect all those involved, defending the fundamental equality whereby everyone is recognized under law as a human being living with others in society. Particular attention must be paid to the most vulnerable who need help in defending their own interests. If this core of values essential to coexistence is weakened, the possibility of agreeing on that recognition of the other, which is the condition for all dialogue in the very life of society, will also be lost. Legislation on health care also needs this broad vision and a comprehensive view of what most effectively promotes deliberate pause, the common good in each concrete situation. Now, Brian knows, and as part of his willingness to dialogue, that this show has been featuring the work of the American Solidarity Party, and we are constantly referring to common good, so that's why I naturally wanted to give this citation from the Holy Father. But also I wanted to give it because Brian's commitment to a democratic process uh, while recognizing fundamental human rights is something that he's just been discussing. Yes, and I think that basically I think it's very good, and the common good, of course, refers to the common good of human beings, which the Holy Father uh, went out of his way to underscore. In fact, every pope actually, since the widespread legalization of human abortion has become common, every, every pope has made that point of the uniqueness of the human person as being the predicate for the common good. It's the commonality of those human beings, regardless of any other consideration, regardless of their rank in society, regardless of their age, regardless of their color, national origin, regardless of their condition, whether well, well capped or handicapped. Uh, the, uh, the fact is, is that it's the humanity that unites us, and that's really at the heart of the Right to Life movement. We're made up of people that really are from different political parties, and beyond protecting lives... There is some debate, well, what else do you give people? Is it the job of government to hand out goodies at? Is that the role of government? No, the actual role of government is first and foremost throughout all of history. It isn't just our nation, but every society has a duty to protect the lives of the innocent. That's why policemen have badges and guns. They specifically are there. They're actually called agents of the court. They are... They're officers of the court, and a police officer is endowed with legal authority to make judicious decisions. And if there's a miscreant, a bad guy, threatening the life of another innocent person, that policeman is one of the few people in all society empowered to intervene and to protect the innocent. So the purpose of society, society itself, is to protect those that cannot protect themselves. Hale and hearty people like Dr. Hanick and myself, we can usually protect ourselves, but should somebody come at me with a gun right now, I can't. And I would hope that there'd be a policeman that would intervene to protect us. That's why we have established the authorities. That's why every society has established authorities, not to lord their authority over the citizens, but first and foremost to protect the lives of the citizenry, our founders so wisely, as wise and learned men who had inherited Western civilization and had a chance now with the distillation of all of Western civilization's values, they could create a new government, and they made that the predicate that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal, endowed by their creator, not endowed by the government, endowed by the creator with these self-evident truths, the self-evident right to be alive. The government doesn't grant that, but it is the government's job to protect that life. And so that's what the right to life is about, protecting the lives of those that cannot protect themselves. So we as citizens must make sure that the laws do that. 
the, the law, law right now, now if Dr. Hannick, Hannick and I saw someone being attacked, he would likely like try to protect them. But, but it's ultimately the, 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 the legal authority's job to do that. We would try to intervene, but we can't be everywhere. And therefore, we come into society for this reason governments are established among men. That's the reason we have governments, to protect the basic essential lives of human beings. And that's what the right to life is all about. Uh, I know that you're headed in the direction of speaking, but you're not going to escape quite so easily. I have at least two and a half of further points to raise. I'll begin with the half point because it's something that we agree on. And that is a preferential option for the poor does not entail a preferential option for big government. We certainly agree on that and this notion of uh, getting goodies and the like that was briefly mentioned uh, needs to be acknowledged. Uh, now, that said, I'm going on to the next point, and I think it connects with what you're saying. This is again from the Holy Father. It could be said that the categorical imperative is never to abandon the sick, the anguish associated with conditions that bring us to the threshold of mortality, and the difficulty of the decision we have to make may tempt us to step back from the patient. Yet this is where, more than anything else, we are called to show love and closeness, for recognizing the limit that we all share and showing our deliberate pause to reference to the party. Uh, yet this is where, uh, more than anything else, we are called to show love and closeness, recognizing the limit that we all share and showing our solidarity. So solidarity is a theme in papal teaching that, that comes in in many different places. It's certainly something that comes into play in, in our needing to stand by the sick and the weak. And the one way that we can stand by the sick and the weak is to make sure that they have access to decent medical care, and that's something else that the Holy Father mentioned. Uh, now... With that said, and allowing for uh, Brian to uh, stop me by the count of zero, three, two, one. So oh, he didn't stop me. He didn't stop me. I'm going on to a last point. Uh, there's an old saying about philosophers stirring the pot. Now, there's another old saying associated with Roman Catholics that they believe in Rome, rum, and rebellion. And there's another view of a jurisprudential sort that's associated not just with Roman Catholics in general, but with our common doctor, also known as the angelic doctor, to it, Thomas Aquinas, who said, and in saying it, he is citing Augustine, and uh, the both of them were quoted by Dr. Martin Luther King, quote, an unjust law is no law at all. And so I want to stir the pot uh, when, when Brian says, look, we have the rule of law. He begins by pointing to a legal framework that was fundamentally sound. Now, some of us wonder... Uh, if we haven't come upon a legal framework that, well, perhaps is not rotten to the core, is nonetheless not fundamentally sound. And I wonder if he would briefly comment on that, or not so briefly, and then I will let him return to the podium. <laughs> well, I tell you, that wasn't just a mouthful, but several mouthfuls. So I'm going to try to distill it down, and, and yes, yes and distill it down and maybe start with Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, which, you know, polysyllabic Latin terms, man, they wear you out. So don't worry about it. What it means is that every, and this is close to his definition, 
every human being is an end in and of themselves and not a means to an end. So that's what, what uh, His Holiness was quoting when he talked about the categorical, imper- categorical imperative. And what it means, think about it in your life, you know people who are users? <laughs> Have you heard of that phrase? Oh, that guy is such a user. And that's when they use people to do what they want. So literally, they're violating the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant. And again, polysyllabic, Latin term, don't get confused by that. It means don't use people. Every human being, according to Christian doctrine, carries the imago dei. Every human being is extraordinary. That's what Christian theology, Judeo-Christian theology is taught. And really, if you think about it, Western society, what is, uh, we don't have time to talk about what is Western civilization, but there's many anthropologists that have said Western civilization started at one point in Greece with a Hippocratic Oath, because now the caregiver, the caregiver was required to honor the life of the vulnerable of the king or of a slave, of a foreigner, of a citizen, every human being was to be cared for and never, ever harmed. Now, why was that significant? Because before the Hippocratic Oath, the physician was, in fact, not only a healer, but a potential killer. Because that was the witch doctor. That healer could come to your house, to your hut, to your tent, that member of society who's supposed to help you. Maybe you paid him a chicken to deal with his illness. You didn't know what it was. Please help me, doctor. But what if your neighbor had given him a goat because your neighbor wanted your property and your wives? Your, ma- your neighbor didn't like you. There was nothing restraining that doctor. That witch doctor used their polysyllabic mumbo-jumbo. They used their knowledge of herbs and medicine, and they would do their chance and be important, and you didn't know if what they were doing was going to kill you or heal you. That was known as savage times. And that's why good anthropologists, even, even kind of wacky ones like Margaret Mead, I think Margaret Mead, I study with Margaret Mead, both conservative and liberal anthropologists point to the beginning of Western civilization being the Hippocratic Oath. Because now one member of society was committed entirely to the idea that this human being must be protected and never harmed. And that influenced, and then even as, as the Greek culture faded, and as Rome took over, they kept the Hippocratic Oath, primum non nocere. And then as Christianity took over Rome, Christianity, which brought with it the information from the Judeo-Christian scriptures, the Imago Dei, let us make God in our image. So there's something special about human beings. That the, the, the Greeks you know, promoted humanism, that, that hum, human beings as a class are the measure of all things. But the Hippocratic Oath made it very specific. That, that every, every human, human being, being individually, individually, it wasn't just the class of human beings, every individual human being is extraordinary. And then our founders, and again, our founders, this was reflected still in Western Sith. In 1215, it was put into law, a tradition. We did not borrow the French laws. We did not borrow Italian and German laws. We took English common law and their knowledge of natural law, and specifically the Magna Carta, and we built a predicate, a nation built on the predicate that every human life is incredibly significant. They're almost, our founding fathers were almost, they were almost motivational speakers. They were basically saying, hey, every human being, you're extraordinary. You're endowed by your creator with incredible rights that the government can't even give you. The government's job is to protect you. You're bigger than the government. The government derives its powers from the value of every life. So back to what Holy Father said, he's actually right in, in quoting Immanuel Kant. The purpose of society is that we live well with one another and protect one another, and that's the purpose of the law, because every single individual life, not the group, but every individual life is endowed by their creator with the rights they have. And the job of government is to protect it. We're going to have to end, but not quite yet. Uh, count on if you're hanging in with us, God bless you. Uh, another four minutes. 
uh, it's important that in all our efforts, from all our different perspectives, we try to maintain a, a sense of humor. And one of the things that's uh, unforgettable in G.K. Chesterton's classic orthodoxy is this discussion of how it is that we might discern the humor of God at work in unexpected places. Here's one place. If you Google, and a number of our speakers trying to get the audience to appreciate the range of discussion on certain issues say, why don't you go ahead and Google? If you Google the Hippocratic Oath, I highly recommend it. Uh, one of its advantages is it's short. Another advantage is it directs itself at crucial issues. But one issue, and I'm not making this up, that it addresses very directly is expressed in the line, part of the Hippocratic Oath, I will treat no kidney stones. Now, if you could see Brian Justin right now, you would know that, that, that this is something that he has thought about in the past. I will treat no kidney stones. Now, the historical background to that is that it's just terribly difficult to treat them. The most they could say is sit in a hot bathtub, but what kind of medicine is that? At any rate, uh, so that's all I have to say, and I want to thank Skylar Kovich. I want to thank Brian Johnson. I want to thank our listeners, and I'd like to end with a prayer which would turn everything upside down. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We'll be back, same time, same station, next Friday. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.